Hello and welcome to our live stream. Eric Kaiser tonight, our industry engagement manager at TrueTech, will be talking about tools and test instrument selection process. This was a presentation he gave live at the HVAC School Symposium. But as always, Eric is constantly tweaking the content um, oh, in a good way, in a good way. And a lot of it's based upon feedback. So if you saw this or watched it before, it's probably going to be a little bit different. If you didn't see it before, it's going to be better than it was. So test instruments are great, but they've got to be appropriate and tailored to the measurement you're making. So, you know, for an instance, like a tape measure, an odometer, you can measure distance, but you wouldn't use an odometer to measure, say, five inches with a car um, unless you really had a lot of time on your hands and, and maybe some dirt and grit from the road. The same thing applies when you're using manometers, like there's Pascal measurement, which is a very fine unit of pressure measurement. And you need to do that, you need a precision manometer and you probably need an auto zeroing precision manometer because pressure meters drift with temperature, even the slightest changes in temperature. There's also set up in the ability to provide consistent data from these, from these uh, devices. So Eric's gonna talk about tool selection and he's gonna cover and, and help you really understand a lot of terminology I think we throw around a lot is accuracy, precision, repeatability. Some of those things just mean it's the instrument you're comfortable using or you've used a lot. And in, and then, you know, you could say, this is my accurate meter, but is it really accurate? So we're gonna break in, into some of these uh, definitions here and talk about setting user requirements, many more things. I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. I'm gonna watch the comment stream, stream and I will interrupt as necessary to help um, move the conversation along. Okay, Eric, all yours. Thanks, Bill, Welcome. appreciate it. Welcome everybody. Uh, as Bill said, we're talking about uh, tool and instrumentation selection here tonight. So uh, let's dig right into this. Um, first, real quick, a uh, little bit about True Tech Tools, right? We're a distributor of tools and test instrumentation for HVACR and building science. Um, we do carry over 90 different brands of tools. We stock a lot of them in, in our warehouse, ready to ship. So we're not drop shipping most of the stuff. Um, we got a very knowledgeable customer service team that answers the phones, answers the uh, live chat on the website, things like that, answers the emails that come in. And uh, I'll give you an email to contact them at the end. Um, uh, we do ship seven days a week, even though our customer support team's only there uh, Monday through Friday, um, typically. There's uh, someone there a little bit on the weekends once in a while, um, but we do ship seven days a week. So if you order something on Sunday, uh, earlier in the day, it's probably going to ship out the same day. Um, and one of the things we try to do is um, industry stewardship, which is really helping the industry and helping the industry to grow, bringing things like this to the industry, uh, working on various aspects of the industry, and just trying to overall help improve the industry for the people that are in it and their customers. With that, let's dig in. So, why are we talking about this tonight? Well, Bill kind of alluded to a lot of that already um, because we need to talk about selecting our tools, selecting our instrumentation to do the job that's necessary. So really one of the first things we, we have to know is what job are we doing? And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on, right? But the tools, okay, or the instrumentation brings things into us, into our brain. We take feedback from things like meters or manometers or whether it's a voltmeter, an amp meter, a watt meter, whatever that is, our, our refrigerant pressures, our temperatures, all that stuff comes into our brain. And then we take that and we make decisions with it. We make a decision about what to talk to our customers about. We might make a decision about what to do next in the troubleshooting process. What parts need to be replaced? What's going bad? Right. So we take all that information in, we process it, and then we make decisions about what to do with hand tools, physical tools, other things like that, what to talk to our customers about, all kinds of different stuff. So it's a process. And if we get bad information in over here, right, the decisions that come out over here about what we do next are not always the best ones that we could have had. So selecting that instrument or, or selecting the tool over here, right? We've got to have the right tools to do the right thing is a very important thing to do. A lot of us take that for granted, but 
there is so many options out there and so many different things that we do and how we do them. We really need to have a process for that. Hey, Don, thanks for watching. Now, let's take fastening a clamp. This is a very simple thing. And this is where I want to really break this down into a very, very simple thing. Okay, so we're going to fasten a clamp to a wall. Now, in order to do that, we might want to use some screws. Okay? We just got some standard screws up here. Now, we know what those are. We know what they're going to do in here. But would we use this to put those screws in the wall? Mm, I mean, you could, I guess. But they're probably not going to hold really well. They're probably going to fall out really fast. It's really not the right tool for the job. Right? So we don't maybe don't want to use a hammer. We probably want to use a screwdriver. So we get a screwdriver, right? Now, is this the right screwdriver for that job? Well, probably not because these are Phillips and that is a flathead. What we need is a Phillips screwdriver to put that in or some other way, mechanical means of driving that screw in, drill probably today. Depends on what you need, but we need the proper interface here to be able to connect to that screw and put it in. So that's a decision process. And it's one that we do automatically. Like none of us are gonna think about, hey, should I grab a hammer to put that in? But if we hadn't learned that somewhere, we might just try to grab a hammer or we might try to grab a flat blade screwdriver without thinking about it because we hadn't learned and we hadn't done it. And now a lot of people that's ingrained in. We all had to learn it somewhere, all right? So that is a little bit of a really basic process about selecting and why you want to select something, right? why we want to think about the work that we're actually doing in order to get the best outcome. Now let's talk about these things here, all right? Yeah, you, you can hammer a screw in. Like you said, doesn't always hold real well. So, you know, Maybe you want to sometimes. I don't know. That's up to you. But typically you want that screw to have a little bit better holding power. That's why we go with screws instead of nails. <laughs> and that's exactly right. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So let's talk about accuracy, precision, and repeatability. Okay, these are some terms we get, as Bill said in the beginning, these terms get thrown around a lot. What do they really mean? Okay. So let's look at a target and we're gonna shoot some arrows at this target, right? And we're gonna make these spots up here. Now, we're shooting tar arrows all over the place on this target, right? It's, it's all over the place, right? We, we wanna be in here, okay? But there's some that aren't even close. There's some that not even maybe close. They're way in the heck out there. So this is just, no, it's not accurate, it's not precise, okay? Now, if we tighten it up a little bit, now we're starting to get a little bit better, right? We're getting closer, all of our measurements, they're getting closer to that center. They're still not really close, but the question we have to ask, is that acceptable for the work that we're doing? Is that good enough, right? Or do we need to go more? Because a lot of times what happens is, if we don't know how close to that center we need to be, we may buy a tool that doesn't get good enough accuracy or precision, and then we spent money to get something that won't do the job properly. Right? Maybe we bought a really small screwdriver, or fill it, you know, somebody got a really small Phillips screwdriver. Well, it's not going to drive the head on that screw because it's too small. So, Maybe that's good enough, maybe it's not. But it's better than what we had on the previous slide. Now, if we get into this, okay, now we have a precise and repeatable measurement, okay, because it's all the measurements are in the same spot or all the arrows are in the same spot. What we're, sh we're, we're, we're hitting very close to each other. So it's repeatable. Do, getting basically the same thing every time. It's precise because it's getting right here. It's very close together. But it's not accurate because it's not where we want to hit. 
So in order to get all three of those, and we move that into the center of the target, that's where accuracy, accuracy precision, and reliability come together. All right, so that's a little bit about what those terms mean. Now, does accuracy matter? How much does it really matter? That's a great question. Okay, and it's one that we have to ask ourselves. Um, even just right before this show, I, I got a phone call from uh, somebody that I know out in the industry, and he was asking me about a tool. And my first question is, okay, what what are you trying to measure? What quantity are you trying to measure? And how accurate do you need it to be? Because if I'm going to help him select a tool, I need to know those things. And he's going to need to know those things in order to help me select a tool or, or select a tool himself. And a lot of times when you ask yourself those questions, you can pretty well narrow down and select the tool that you want. All right. So let's talk about accuracy as it's presented to us in a couple of different ways that it gets presented. Right, so one way it gets presented is in percentage. Okay, so plus or minus ten percent. Sometimes we see that accuracy out there. So in this case, we're going to use an example. We're going to use a scale. All right, so whatever this is measures between zero and two hundred. That's our scale. Now there's a couple different ways we can use that ten percent. We could use that 10%, um, and we'll get to that here in a minute. So our displayed value on this is 100, all right? And there's two different ways we can use this. We can do a 10% plus or minus of the reading, right? That reading of 100. Or we can do plus or minus 10% of full scale. So let's take a look at that. If we do plus or minus 10% of our reading, 100, our range of accuracy is plus 10 or minus 10 off whatever that reading is. Now, if it's a full scale, it's plus or minus 20. Now, the interesting thing is these change, or one of them changes, as the, as the measurement moves. So if I have a measurement of 150 on that same instrument, and I'm looking at 10% of the reading, now my inaccuracy is wider as the reading increases versus if it's plus or minus 20% of full scale, now my inaccuracy is the same. So this is how accuracies and percentages work, okay? So that percentage changes, the, the actual inaccuracy value changes with the reading as it goes higher if it's a percentage of the reading. Now let's talk about uh, something that's near and dear to all of us in this industry, subcooling calculation. We do this right, we do this all the time. Subcooling is a calculated value, it's not a measured value. It's something that we are taking two different readings, we're taking those values and we're feeding them into one to make a calculation. We can't directly read that, we have to have a, two temperatures to read it. So, with subcooling, this becomes challenging because now we have two different meters or two different instruments, and we have a compounding inaccuracy or a compounding error, and they stack on top of each other. And depending on how they work, they can really throw things off. So let's use an example here. We've got an analog pressure gauge, right? It's rated at plus or minus what's called 323 of full scale, right? And we look at a K-type thermocouple thermometer and it's rated accuracy uh, plus or minus th three tenths of a percent of the reading plus two degrees Fahrenheit. So the way you calculate that is you take the reading, you figure out what the 0.3% is and then you add two degrees onto that, whatever that is. So we, now we have two inaccuracies. Now, a 323 of a full scale analog gauge, right, is the first quarter or the first third, depending on how they rate that. And the last quarter or last third is at 3% of full scale. And the middle third or the middle half is 2% of full scale. And the reason it's rated that is because in the middle is where we read most of the time. 
the very far ends of the gauge, we typically don't read. And if it's in there, there's something wrong. So we don't need that extra accuracy. Now, can we get better gauges? Yeah, but they cost more money. So we got to make sure there's a trade-off here. And we have to make sure that we're buying the right tools for the job. Now, we're going to look at this. Um, this is a typical 410A pressure gauge range, 800 PSI on the high side. That's where we're going to calculate subcooling off of. Okay, so we're just going to do this one in thirds. So my middle or my my ends are plus or minus 24 psi, right? That's my three percent. Middle two percent plus or minus 16 psi. So now we know what our plus minus range is in there. Right? So we could be off from the factory. They have no problem with that. Could be off plus or minus 16 PSI on that gauge, right? Now, in order to calculate this, we got to do a little bit of math. Yeah, I know, it's no fun, but we don't have to do it very often. So let's take a look at it, right? We're going to take a 410A system, 365 PSIG, right? That's 109.8, we're going to say 110 degree saturation temperature, right? My liquid line temperature is 100 degrees. Right, so our calculated subcooling is going to be 10 degrees. That's pretty easy math to do. Now, we're, here's where it gets interesting. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a visual after, after this so you can see this even better. So our saturation temperature here, right, 16 PSI, plus or minus. So that saturation pressure or, or the pressure with the, telling us the saturation temperature could be anywhere from 349 to 381 PSI. And, and these are all gauge numbers. So that's plus or minus 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit just in our saturation temperature number. And that doesn't account for parallax on the gauge, which is where if you're not looking at that needle just dead on and you're a little bit off and you know the, the width of the needle and everything else, that's a whole different topic. We're just talking about the accuracy of that gauge provided that you're reading it dead straight on. Okay, now, our 100 degree Fahrenheit liquid line, all right? That is plus or minus 2.3 degrees Fahrenheit or 97.7 to 102.3. So now we have our two inaccuracy ranges. We have two known values there. Now our subcooling value, right, is 9.8 degrees Fahrenheit. We're gonna round that up to 10, but it's plus or minus five and a half degrees by the time we bring those two together, and I'll show you why. Okay, so if we look at this, here's our saturation temperature and our plus minus range. Here's our line temperature, all right, and the plus minus range to go with that. So if we're dead on, everything's accurate, no problem. There's our subcooling value. But what happens if my temperature gauge is reading at the extreme low end of that range, okay, and my pressure gauge is at the high end of the potential inaccuracy range? Now, is this going to happen all the time? No, it's not. It's probably going to be pretty rare out there, but let it be known that it can it could happen. It has the potential to happen. Okay? So now we have potential inaccuracy range between those two of 15.3 degrees. All right. Between those two, 4.3, depending on which way we go. So plus minus of that is where we ended up with that 9.8 degrees. That's how I ended up with that because this is on the low end, that, back that up, that 15.3 is on the high end, and my known value, of course, is, or my, my theoretical calculated value is in the middle, the, the, what value it should be if that's actually what it is, but my temperature and my pressure could be off. So we have a potential inaccuracy there of a lot. Okay, five and a half degrees plus or minus. Now, if you look at most condensing units, they want 
they're set up to be a little tighter than that. The ones I'm used to working on are probably about two degrees, maybe three degrees plus or minus at the most. So just so you know, that analog gauge and that K-type thermocouple are not going to produce that accuracy. They don't have that accuracy rating dead out of the factory, much less after they get bounced around in a truck and anything else happens to them. All right. Now, let's talk about that same subcooling calculation. We're going to use a little bit different tool here. So we're going to go to a digital pressure gauge, right? This has got a rating of plus or uh, um, digital pressure gauge rated accuracy, right? It's 0 to 200, plus or minus 1 PSI, 201 to 580. We're at plus or minus 2 PSI and over 581 to 800, plus or minus 1 PSI, plus 5% of the reading. Again, we're going to calculate that those same numbers, we're just going to use the accuracy of this meter instead. Okay. And then we're going to use a temperature meter with a rated accuracy of plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit. So let's go through and do that same thing. Right. Um, same saturation temperature, same line temperature. Right. Now our plus or minus two PSI. So we have a plus or minus. 0.4 degree range on our saturation temperature and our line temperature plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit gets our subcooling value, our, our rated inaccuracy on that is plus or minus 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. So narrowed that up a whole lot tighter. Okay, so again, we look at that. Now we're talking 0.4, one degree Fahrenheit plus or minus Okay, we go here to here, right? That's 11.2. So if this is 9.8, 11.2, that's our 1.4 degree inaccuracy. Or if we go this way, we end up with 8.4. And that's how we end up at that plus or minus 1.4 degrees. So, and if you guys have questions, throw them in the chat there. Bill will be happy to pop in here and answer things. Um, <clears throat> let's see. What would be a good way to confirm calibration between two then? Um, you have to calibrate each instrument independently, and it has to be done to a reference point. And a reference point is a known temperature or a known pressure. Um, typically for temperature calibrations, we, used a, uh, we use a crushed ice bath. Um, which if it's crushed ice and water, it's going to be right at 32 degrees. If you try to put big cubes in there, you want a really a tight mixture of crushed ice and water. Um, and if you try to put big cubes in there, you're not going to hit the 32 degree point on that water because there's too much separation between the surface points of the ice. So your, your water is going to be a little bit warmer. Um, and then on the pressure side, the best thing that we have is going to be a um, tank of refrigerant, but you've got to have a thermometer to use that with your PT chart. So you have to have an accurate thermometer uh, for your gauges. Yep. On it, Don. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, so you have to have an accurate thermometer in order to read the temperature of that tank to know what the saturation temperature in the tank is to be able to translate back translate that into a pressure. So you have to calibrate each one individually. You can't calibrate them to each other. So really in that case, you need to calibrate the thermometer first uh, and then take that and use it to calibrate the pressure gauges. Um, pressure gauges are um, uh, especially on analog ones, just zeroing, just putting that dial to zero is not calibrating it. That's zeroing the gauge. Calibrating is actually putting it to a known pressure quantity. All right. And that's where we can use a tank of refrigerant as long as we know what the temperature of that refrigerant is. Great question. Thank you very much. So, Talked a little bit about some accuracy calculations there. Let's dig into a little bit more about accuracy calculations here, because some of them get a little bit hairy. We talked about really simple percentage accuracy there, um, which is 
um, a little bit different. Uh, now, now we're going to dig into a little bit more. Um, so this is where we get um, an accuracy range, right, of a percentage plus a value. And we talked, just, we touched on that briefly in there, uh, in, in the digital gauges, right, percentage plus a value. So we're going to talk about a percentage plus a number, right? So if our reading is 100, and again, I'm just using this as a, a simple and easy number here to do. All right, here's the accuracy calculation. 1% of the reading is 1, or 100 times 0.01, you get 1, plus 1, so our inaccuracy is 2. So it's plus or minus 2 in that case. So that's how you take a percentage plus a number to get your total accurate plus minus accuracy range. All right, so plus or minus two, or the range of inaccuracy is 98 to 102 there. So that's a pretty simple one to calculate. Um, we're going to get into a little bit more here. This one is what's called percentage plus digits. And it's kind of like that, that value, but it moves depending on what's going on on the screen of the meter. And this is really commonly used with electrical meters. So that's why I highlighted this one. So digits, okay. The stated accuracy, we're talking about plus or minus two and a half percent of the reading plus 15 digits, okay. Now our range is going to be 0.01 to 200. Our resolution is 0.01. So we're talking about hundreds of whatever that is. Okay. Make sure you're, you know what you're talking about there at hundreds because resolution is important in this calculation. So our reading is 100.00. Sometimes this is also termed as least significant digits, things like that. But in this case, what we do is we're going to take 2.5% of the reading times the reading plus the digits times the resolution. So it's going to be 2.5 times 100 plus 15, all right, times 0.01. So we end up with an inaccuracy of 2.875 there. That's plus or minus 2.875. So it can get a little confusing to do that at first. Uh, it, this is one of those that I highly recommend. If you want to do this, build it into a spreadsheet and let it do it. Um, you can just have those three inputs there, um, your, your uh, uh, resolution, the reading, uh, and it will just pop everything right in for you. Um, so plus or minus would be 2.88, right? 97.12 to 102.88 at that 100 reading could be anywhere in there. Okay. How are we doing on questions? Okay. Looks like we got nothing coming in. Uh, nothing new. Besides, there is one comment. You can also use a hand pump for calibration. I assume that was for pressure meters, but you would still need a reference, correct? That's correct. It You can use a hand pump for that, but you have to have a reference measurement on there to know how much pressure that hand pump is putting in. So you would have to have a reference gauge on that um, hand pump or some other kind of pump to create a pressure that is known. So yeah, that is, that's a valid way to, to make a pressure. Uh, you just have to have a very, uh, an accurate gauge because if your reference gauge is inaccurate, then you can automatically calibrate your other gauge to an inaccurate value. So then we get stacking inaccuracies, which is why we have um, typically reference standards like that are what's called NIST traceable. Um, and they are very tightly controlled, highly accurate instruments at calibration centers. So you can send a, a, a meter or gauge or whatever into them and they have a very highly accurate reference point and then they calibrate to that. So. Does location matter, right? Test location. Some of us might know this, right? But a TXV bulb 
is a sensing bulb. It's a measurement device, right? Does it make a difference where on that line we mount that TXV bulb? Depends on the size of the line. But yeah, in general, it's gonna make a difference, right? We probably don't wanna put it down here. Over here, up here, depending on what you're working on, yeah, either one of those positions is probably gonna be okay. But most people would not recommend mounting that bulb down on the bottom. So yes, test location does matter. So let's look at this example, all right? We've got a, a heating device here. We're gonna say gas furnace. We've got a evaporator coil on top of it. And we've got three test points. Right? Test point one, probably not gonna be a really great place to go because we're in visual line of sight, even through that coil, you can still see through those coils enough that the heat from that heat exchanger is going to be, it's gonna have radiant heat on it, right? Which is gonna transfer up here and it could potentially throw off our reading because it's gonna artificially heat this sensor up that's right up here. And we really don't want that. We need an accurate reading. Now, a little bit farther up the duct, this might be okay. Most people say three to four feet away is enough. But if you really wanna make sure you wanna come down here, you wanna get around this corner so you don't have any line of sight to that heat generating location. So you don't get the radiant heat affecting your temperature sensor. So this is one example of does test location matter? Yeah, it does in most cases. We've gotta pay attention to know when it matters. All right, same thing, I wouldn't wanna put a cooling coil measurement right here because this is gonna radiantly cool the temperature sensor right here. If I radiantly cool that because heat goes high to low, it's gonna pull more heat off of there than it's gonna lower the temperature of that temperature sensor lower than what the actual air temperature is because we know that the surface temperature of this coil has to be colder than the air leaving it. Otherwise, we couldn't transfer heat into it. So it can artificially make your reading look low. Again, we wanna get down here past this. This might be okay if you can't get anywhere else, but you need to get as far away from it as possible, preferably around that corner. All right, let's talk about another place where test location matters. Right? This is an example of a vacuum system, okay? We got a pump out here. We've got multiple gauges placed on a system. This is a fun one. And I know this industry's talked a lot about vacuum. It has improved massively in the 20 years I've been in this industry. The, the, the knowledge uh, and the technology that we have to do better vacuum on systems today is night and day difference, right? And it's, thankfully, it's finally going around the industry. Uh, I'm super happy to see that still. But when we have a system, all right, with a vacuum pump hooked up, the pump is always the lowest pressure point because if we think about this as pushing everything, the pump creates a low pressure, and the higher pressure in this system pushes everything towards the pump. So this is gonna be my highest pressure location, as far away from that pump as I can get, versus it's gonna get lower and lower and lower the closer I get to that pump. So this was an example, the first time I really started learning about vacuum and really digging in and I borrowed another gauge from a coworker and I started putting multiple gauges on a system because I was having troubles that I couldn't figure out. And this is what I found, right? My indoor coil was over 10,000 microns still. You know, even at my outdoor access port, I'm at 2,000 microns. But when I came into the trade, where I was taught to put my vacuum gauge was right out here on top of that pump. Hey, we got great vacuums all the time. It's quick. It was fast. It was easy. But it didn't do the job that we needed to do because we weren't getting all this stuff out of that system. Right? And because we didn't get all that out, occasionally we had problems every once in a while. It was less because we were running vacuum pumps. At least we were doing that. But, and we were doing something with the gauge, 
but we still occasionally had some problems out here. Okay. This is another good one. And this is something that is very necessary in the industry today, a true RMS meter, because of what we have in the way of EC motors, the electronically commutated motors, the uh, frequency drives that are running our compressors today. That's basically what they are. It's an inverter, but you can think of it as a frequency drive. If you're familiar with frequency drives, it alters the electricity that's going into that motor from a standard sine wave that's coming through the power lines. And because of that, it creates some back feeding on the power lines. And when we go to measure it with a meter, if it's not a true RMS meter, you can get some, some interesting readings. So this is a standard sine wave, what a standard sine wave looks like on an AC power line, right? This is zero voltage, and our AC makes 60 of these per second, 60 cycles per second, up to a peak voltage, down to a peak voltage, negative, positive, all right? And a normal meter reads an average of this. So we're getting an average of that voltage between zero and peak. Now that's easy to do if you have a good sine wave. If you have a messed up sine wave because of an inverter, you get things, sine waves that look like this and they chop it all up and they make weird, odd shapes and all kinds of stuff if you're looking at it on an oscilloscope and our regular meters don't like that. So that's where we need to have a true RMS meter. Now, these sine waves, if you measure with a regular meter, you get somewhere between plus 10 to negative 40% of your reading of inaccuracy, depending on what you're reading, what the sine wave actually is, it can really screw up your readings on that meter. So if you're looking at anything with, with any kind of an inverter in it, which is a lot of our equipment out there today, make sure you're running a true RMS meter. Okay. Now, does resolution matter? I don't know. That really depends on what you're doing. Okay. You know, if we're trying to read gross pressure, whether it's going up or down, hmm, this might be all right. But if I wanted to read really fine pressure, I think I want something a little bit different. Okay. So 29.919 inches of mercury is equal to 10,000 microns. I'm sorry, 29.919 inches of mercury is equal to that 52 microns. I'm getting my slides messed up here. 29.527 inches of mercury is 10,000 microns. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't tell the difference between those two values on that gauge. So yes, resolution matters, okay? It matters in how well we're gonna see what's going on. If we need really fine pressure measurements, we need to make sure that we match the tool to the job that we're trying to do. Now, let's talk about a selection process for this. And a selection process is really figuring out what the heck we're trying to do, what we're trying to measure, what results we're looking for, and what kind of accuracy. Right? And then we start looking at what's available, what can do that, right? So we want to do, we set what I call user requirements, right? So what's the desired outcome from the tool? What's the accuracy, the precision, the re repeatability required, right? What's the resolution that we need? What sort of environment is it going to operate in, right? And where am I going to store it? Because these are all things you got to think about anytime you're buying, especially electronics, you're going to be storing them somewhere. Are they going to hold up to being in a really hot truck or a really cold truck? Because you're probably not going to bring everything inside every night or have a heated storage space for a truck or a van or something like that. And last but not least, this is something that's really come about uh, in recent years, is what's your desired interface? 
do you want to be able to pick that meet that that meter up and do you want to read that meter face on or do you say want to pick up your phone and be able to look at that remotely now some people might say ah you know i just want to look at the meter you know i used to be in that camp and i thought well we don't need all this bluetooth stuff I, i've been looking at meters for years and then i realized there's a lot of safety pluses and some really handy things to be able to put that meter inside of a um, blower cabinet. You know, uh, when I started, all we could do was run our, our um, clamp lead out through the edge of the cabinet because we didn't have a remote screen. We didn't have Bluetooth. So we had to try to figure out how to get our meter leads around the door and put the door back on a furnace or an air handler or a, um, a rooftop unit, whatever it was, and then be able to see all this stuff outside if we couldn't get to a decent place to read amperage or something outside that. Well, now I can throw that meter inside to have Bluetooth and sit there to look on my phone and not have to damage my meter leads because I cut up a number of rather expensive meter leads over the years trying to do that. So that interface, I think, is a really important thing to consider today. Um, it's, it's really changed the way we do things. It's also a lot safer, right? Who wants to be sticking their hands and their head in live electrical cabinets and stuff like that when I can hook something up, close the door, energize it, de-energize it with that door closed and never, uh, never have that um, be around. That's going to depend a lot on what work you're doing, but it's something to think about. So if we know that, now we can start doing that. So we're going to walk through a, a selection process on a clamp meter. We're going to look at some of the things we need to consider. So we need to look at what we're reading and what we need to read, right? Do we need to do any or all of these? AC voltage, DC voltage, AC current. Maybe we need to do DC current. That's becoming a thing now. If you're, if you're doing solar or anything like that, you may want to do DC current. So, uh, millivolts, AC, microamps, DC. Right? Those are two common things that we need to measure uh, in the HVAC world uh, because, well, that's flame signal right there. All right. Milliamps. There's more sensors and things out there now that are using milliamps. We may need to be able to measure that. All right. Uh, capacitance. Obviously, we do a lot of capacitors on things, although they're changing a little bit with the inverters. Now, a lot of them are on the boards and they've got really high voltage in them. So, know what you need to measure there. Uh, resistance, that's still a great thing to be able to measure. Measuring the resistance, looking for broken wires, checking components. Good idea. Diode test. This is one that I think is underutilized and is really important when we're talking about inverters because with inverters, we use diode bridges to convert the AC power into DC power. So we really need to have a diode test method on that meter uh, to be able to verify whether or not that diode bridge is good. It's a good feature to have. All right, watts. So a lot of the newer meters now will do a direct wattage reading. And this is where they combine the voltage reading and the amperage reading into a direct wattage reading, which is being required for a lot of standards today, code compliance standards and things like that. So having a wattage on a meter is not necessarily a bad thing because in a lot of cases, that's how these units are rated is in wattage, maybe not necessarily amperage or, or voltage, but the combination of those two. And that's how the customer is billed in electricity is watts. Um, inrush current. That's a great thing for checking startup of a motor, compressors, anything like that. So that's a really great thing to have in a meter in our uh, environment. Um, min and max. This is, a, in my opinion, a very underutilized feature. And if you know how to use it, you can do a lot of troubleshooting with it because it's kind of like a miniature uh, data logger. So if you hook that meter up to something, it's going to record the maximum and the minimum, whatever that is after you start it. And sometimes you can even get average in there, but you can find a lot of issues. So if you have a sudden voltage drop that's causing something to drop out in a control circuit, 
you put a meter on there and you look for that min max and you can see if it ever drops out because that meter is going to pick it up on the min side, the minimum side, faster than a display can change and your eyes will never see it on that digital display. They may not even see it on an analog meter because it takes time for that needle to move, but that digital meter on the min max can actually pick it up. Same thing on the other side if you have voltage spikes, but a lot of times it's it's a, a dropout that's we're looking for. So those are that's a great thing to have. Um, hold feature. So hold is where you go in to take a measurement. Maybe you want to take a, a, an ampage measurement on something, but you can't see that display. You don't have a Bluetooth display, so you stick your meter in there. You take an amperage reading. You push the hold button, and then you can pull it out and read it. Okay. So again, that's a uh, another great thing to have. Uh, Bluetooth, and that talks, you know, that goes back to that display, whether or not we want to have the um, uh, remote reading capability or remote operating capability. Uh, Non-contact voltage, I kind of like having that in the meter. Uh, another way to check for live voltage, anytime I'm going into a cabinet or something like that, uh, or a piece of equipment, I want to check that case. I want to check everything on that to make sure that that thing is not live before I go laying hands on it. There's been a few people really hurt and or killed um, by live cabinets and whatnot, and a non-contact voltage tester could have saved them. Um, I like to carry two of them around. I like to have one in my shirt pocket, and I like to have one on my meter and test things every which way, especially if I've never worked on it and I don't, I'm not familiar with the equipment. So I think it's a good thing to have on there. Um, temperature. You know, some people still use that in a multimeter. Um, kind of a toss up whether you want to still use that or not in a multimeter, but if you do, it's in a lot of multimeters. If you don't want it in your meter, you know, maybe that's, maybe it comes with it, but you're not going to use it. So again, you need to make sure you're figuring out what you want to do, how you want to do it with a meter. And maybe you can't get all of that in one meter. But if you have a list that you know what you need to operate or what kind of readings you need to take, now you can say, hey, this meter doesn't do everything, but it'll do most of it. And I can get a second meter or a different meter uh, that will do the stuff that my primary meter won't. So in those specific situations, if you don't see those specific situations very often, you may have to have a second meter. Um, when I was in the truck, I think I had like five or six different meters, all for different scenarios and different things what, that I was doing. Now, let's talk about range. Okay. So these are some common ranges, right? AC voltage, right? A hundredth of a volt there all the way up to 600 volts. Um, same thing with DC. Uh, AC current, well... Um, hundredth of an amp up to 80 amps. That's going to cover most everything that we see in residential and like commercial, unless you're going into really heavy stuff, then you're going to need something bigger. But beware that if you go getting a clamp that's got a 200 or 400 or a 600 amp rating on it, it's not going to be able to get this resolution and it's not going to have good accuracy at those really low numbers. So if your focus is on heavier, higher amperage, higher wattage things, you want to go find something that um, has that, that higher range on it. Uh, but if your focus is on really lower things and, um, um, you know, lower amperages, lower wattages, you want to find something that's got that lower reading capability because the bigger stuff may not even be able to read some of those stop at, you know, five amps or two amps or one amp or something like that. They can't read down in that really low range. You know, millivolts, right? What kind of range do we need for that? So we've got to know what equipment we're working on. We've got to know what we're going to be reading or what we think we're going to be reading. Microamps. Um, you know, we need to make sure we're in whatever range we have to be in. Uh, capacitance check, load versus cap check. Okay, so you're talking about a loaded capacitor check versus a bench test where you disconnect the wires from it. Um, either one's good, and I like both of them for different reasons. 
I like the loaded capacitor check because it gives me the value when that capacitor is actually in the circuit on a run capacitor is what we're talking about here. Um, I like that test. Um, I don't know if there's any meters out there right now off the top of my head. I was thinking somebody had put that into a meter, but I don't know if anybody's really doing that in a meter as far as a live load test off the top of my head. Um, there was somebody I think that was talking about it. And I don't know if they ever did. I think it would be a really cool thing to put the live capacitor check into a meter as opposed to just the bench check um, because I think both of them have value. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to do because you can show the customer then, hey, this is what it looks like under load versus this is what it looks like disconnected, which means that capacitor is starting to fail. It's breaking down when it gets under a load. Yeah, it looks good out here, but now I can, tell, I can start to predict we're going to have problems with this capacitor. So making that comparison, I think, is a very useful thing. Hopefully that answered your question, right? So milliamps, capacitance, as we talked about, um, make sure you know what capacitance range you're on because sometimes we'll get a range, but it's not the microfarad. It might be a picofarad, which is, it looks like a little P in front of that. So make sure if you have an auto ranging meter, this is something I don't even have on here, but it's an auto ranging. So meters have multiple ranges on the display and it may auto range to picofarads. And if you have a bad capacitor, you may get a reading that looks like a good microfarad reading, but it says PF instead of UF. And that can really throw people off sometimes. So be careful of that. Know what your meter's reading when you look at it. All right, ohm readings, right? So resistance, do we need to go up into mega ohm readings? Um, how low of a resistance do we wanna go? Now, resistance scale is very important today for um, the temperature sensors we're seeing in a lot of equipment, uh, especially in more of the inverter stuff. We're seeing more temperature sensors that do controls. And I see we're running close to, to time here. So, um, you know, our diode selection, we need to know what our diode is going to be tested at. Wattage, how high or low do we need to read our wattage at? Um, and this is another one where if we get too high, it's not going to read accurately in the really low ranges, maybe where we need to. So we got to be careful of that. Um, your inrush current, what am I reading there? How high do I need to go? What size equipment am I working on? If you're doing residential light commercial, 200 amp might be just perfect. That's probably everything you're going to need. It may be even a little bit excess. But if you're going up into heavier stuff, higher tonnage stuff, then you're going to want to select a meter that goes higher um, and also probably have a meter for low stuff or small stuff. Depends on how accurate you want your meter to be. Um, min max, right? There's, there's not really a value there, it just is. And the hold, same thing, Bluetooth. I would look for BTLE or the latest Bluetooth version um, to make sure that you've got a really strong Bluetooth connection because the older connections, sometimes they weren't quite as good, they weren't quite as stable, okay? Um, Non-contact voltage, you want that to be higher than the absolute uh, voltage you're going to be reading. And what kind of temperature range you're going to be looking at. 1,000 degrees is probably excessive uh, for most things we do. Okay, and then there's resolution, right? Where out here do you want to go for, for resolution? And in the interest of time, I'm going to run through those pretty quick, give you a little chance to, to look at that. Uh, but again, there's there's a lot of different resolutions out there. What what you want to have, um, what kind of stuff do you get on non-contact voltage? Is it going to give you a light or a tone? Uh, what kind of temperature resolution do you want to have? So again, kind of understand what you're looking for, what you need to know, and then make a selection so that you're getting the reading that you need. Okay, here's some other things to consider. You want to know what your safety rating is. Now, your safety rating has to do with where in the system you're measuring your um, electricity at and what the voltage is at that point. Uh, you can Google some stuff. It'll explain. There's a lot of things right on the Internet that'll explain safety rating really well to you. IP rating. If you think you're going to be in um, 
dust and water. Um, let's see. Looks like we got a question. Also, know your thermocouple type. Most thermocouples that we use in the HVACR industry are going to be K-type. But yes, if you think you've got something other than a K-type thermocouple, then you want to know if that meter will read it. Uh, if you're if you're outside um, a K-type in the HVACR industry, you're probably going to have to have a specialized meter just to read that thermocouple because all the electrical meters that measure temperature I know of are K-type only. Okay. Uh, what's your altitude above sea level? That can change. Certain meters don't like to go too far out of that sea level range. Again, it's odd things sometimes that'll trip you up. What's your temperature, your storage, your operation? What kind of humidity are you going to be working in? If you're in a high, hot, high humid environment, you may need something with a dust and water protection on it because you don't want condensation getting in there. And back to that true RMS. Now, that pretty much wraps up everything I had. Anybody got any other questions? Uh, we don't really. Uh, Don Gillis said he had to drop. Great job, Eric. Thanks, Don. Appreciate you watching tonight. He may be one of the founding members of the Eric Kaiser fan club. <laughs> Don's a great guy. If you yeah. don't know Don, he's, he's an awesome individual. If you ever get a chance to watch him train, I like Don. So I want to give a a little bit of a plug here for True Tech. I'm going to take over the screen and do that right now. So this is a little view of our website here. Hopefully you're a customer. If you're not, you should take a look at the website. We've got a lot of great things displayed in wonderful fashion. A lot of popular brands, a total of 90 brands, as Eric mentioned earlier. We have sales, we have promotions, we have special kits. We have our big categories here and each and every one of the products. I'll just pick one here at random. Um, has a great description behind it uh, to help you understand it. We help to help you understand it, the process to use it, so you can eventually buy it and put it to good good use. Also, wanted to give you a little bit of a preview. Uh, this is our Building HVAC Science podcast schedule. This is insider information right here. <laughs> uh, this is what we got coming up tomorrow's uh, podcast at 7 a.m. We'll be inside the toolbox, rethinking HVAC with a high end twist with Chris Wisniewski. Chris is a contractor, a very successful contractor in New Jersey. Uh, we connected with him, he told a great story that we put on the podcast. Here are all the podcasts that we've done this year. As you can see, they go back in time all the way to 2017. We're up to tomorrow's launch will be 156 podcasts. You can watch those or listen to them on our YouTube channel. You can uh, pick them up on buildinghvacscience.com. Uh, we're also on Spotify, every one of the major podcast apps. And of course, uh, Apple and Google Play, you can uh, download and subscribe to the podcast. I also did want to mention uh, we're, we're wearing Eric Thin here the next few weeks. Um, he will be at the ACCA 2024 conference. Uh, he'll be walking around perusing things. He will also be doing a podcast. He is with the press team. He's got a press pass to that, uh, to that event. So if you're going there, uh, look for him. Uh, just kind of look up. He's a little bit tall. You'll see him above the crowd. The National Educators Conference is coming up. Uh, this is coming up in uh, March, and uh, Eric will be there presenting a couple of times. We'll also have Josh Crawley there and Casey Prater, both from our customer service and sales teams. Another great event to look forward to. And then the National Home Performance Conference. And again, you'll find Eric there too uh, with Josh Crawley. That's in Minneapolis. There's a lot of great crossover happening between HVAC and home performance. Here's a really great place to learn the full um, full opportunities with educational sense sessions. You can gain CEUs, uh, including Nate CEUs. Uh, and there's a great place to uh, network with the trade show in, in Minneapolis. Great place to be. So I wanted to thank you all uh, for attending. And uh, it's, I don't see any other comments here except uh, thank you. We rock and well done, guys. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Froggy Beluga and David Johnsonola. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. All right. And, uh, if you need to get a hold of me, there's my email address. Or if you want to get a hold of our customer support team, support at truetechtools.com can uh, help you out with that. There you go. And if you ever think of doing anything like this, use StreamYard. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it a lot easier. Things are so easy. And to hey, make. if you guys have anything, anything you would like to see us present yeah. on or any topics you want us to bring up on here, uh, we're going to try to do this about once a month going forward is right. the plan. 
and um, try to bring a little bit different topic every month, something to do with the industry. Sometimes it's going to be with tools and instrumentation. Sometimes it's not. So uh, um, let us know. We'll just keep you guessing. Yeah. <laughs> We'll Thank probably you. put an announcement out about a week or so in advance. So. Yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll catch it. Just be ready. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good Thanks night. Thanks, everybody. Good night.